when it starts, I'll start talking. Seems like it um, has started. So I'm going to go ahead and <clears throat> do my screen share. So um, like usual, I'll drop the um, URL for the page into the chat in case you like to look at those things. And um, now today we're doing session 10, which is on regression. This is the first um, kind of like, um, like really important stats topic that we've covered. So we're getting in the next few sessions are our important sessions. If we just sort of look at um, the next few sessions, sessions 11 and 12, and I'll just uh, drop in the um, URL for the bootcamp pages in case people want to look around. Today we're on regression, uh, which we're only going to go over in a 30 minute or 45 minute lecture and demonstration, but I want to set the context for this and maybe make a suggestion for how you can think of regression. Really, um, for the next few sessions, they're titled, as you can see down here, I'll make it a little bit bigger. They're titled Regression, T-Test, and ANOVA. <clears throat> but uh, all of these things, regression, T-Test, and ANOVA, are linear models. That's what we, that's what a lot of people call them. Definitely statisticians would recognize them as just linear models. Why do we call them linear models? Well. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole explanation, but the reason that we we call them uh, linear models is um, is that <clears throat> that they all uh, test um, certain parameters against explanatory factors. So for a simple linear regression, it's just one continuous variable. For a t-test, it's one factor with exactly two levels. And with ANOVA, it, a one-way ANOVA, it's a factor with, with more than two levels. Um, and they can be generalized to a linear model. And a, the thing I wanted to say is that um, it starts to get technical and some of the technical details, uh, I wanna say that they're important, but um, more than just merely saying they're important, I wanna say there are subtleties to them that um, that make them easier to work with if you think about them a lot. And so some of those subtleties are things we, you know, most people work on for a long time. And um, there's a lot of detail that is missing from what I'm going to go through in a 45 minute session. And to uh, to put that into context, there are whole there are whole textbooks just written about simple linear regression and and other forms that build on simple linear regression and so some of those details become important for those those um, other forms of regression and all, and also to kind of give you perspective on it in biology um, and in ecology and in the natural sciences these days um, you would tend to have a stats class as part of your formal training, usually at the bachelor's level, usually also at the master's level, sometimes at higher levels. And uh, usually that one class, it might last a, a term or a semester, or maybe sometimes they would last more than that. Has, has anybody ever taken a class for a whole year in statistics? Any of you in the chat? If you have, you know, say say it in the in the um, in the chat. But to put it into context, as somebody who's being trained in statistics would usually have a um, a whole year at least of training in in regression. And, uh, and for me personally, PhD students in the states, the programs are longer. Uh, so I took two years of classes just on regression and linear models <laughs> as a PhD student after lots of math and stats before that. So it's kind of a thing that you really think about for a long time. And the, what we're going to talk about today is uh, just the basics that you can build on. And you can start using it instantly with your own data. Linear regression is the most popular stats 
tool and it's very, very useful. Even in the age of AI, that's not going to change. As a matter of fact, some people, I, you know, not everybody agrees with them, of course, but some people refer to linear models um, and construe it as AI or even machine learning. So it's a different way of thinking about um, these inferential statistics. But never mind, I don't want to digress too much and say all that. If you, if I make this a little bit bigger for everyone, um, have all the links and everything as usual for today. The um, Bootcamp 10 link, I've already dropped the general link uh, in the chat and the slides are here. If you'd like to follow along, I'm just going to test the slides and download them for myself. Now, Megan made these slides, but we uh, agreed beforehand that I would deliver the slides today um, so that I can really, so that I can elaborate where I see fit about regression. This is a topic I really like, you know, I, it's fun for me to talk about regression. I'm just going to make this big. I'm just going to start up my my pin. I'm just going to make this so that I can see chat. Yeah, I see in there, Tim, that you, you know, usually I call that one semester stats class. <clears throat> the first stats class. And um, it's usually crams a lot of stuff in there and it it's perpetrated multiple times, you know, for applied scientists usually. It's a thing that I've spent a lot of my career thinking about how to make it better, how to improve it. And I've delivered it to all sorts of students over the years, um, not just agriculture students, but general biology students, um, ecology students, medical students, nurses. I've taught to all of those groups for, and some of the classes uh, here at Harper, it's the master's class that I taught until recently was about 50, 60 students. Some of you have taken a, a version of that class, at least Megan has in the past before I taught it. Um, but ones I taught in the past, had up to 500 students in the lecture. So it would be giving a lecture like this on regression to 500 students. So we're continuing with the boot camp. Um, I, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I've been putting, I've been kind of having this uh, pedantic battle with some people here at Harper about the term boot camp. I've mentioned it before in here possibly, but the battle continues even over the um, Easter break. Um, had an, another call to stop calling it the boot camp because it so, seems so testosterone laden and unkind that it might turn some people off. But the reason I'm I'm not going to turn it off is because the boot camp um, is a, kind of a thing. It's kind of a jargon thing uh, these days for stats and and data science. And um, what it connotes is learning something that might be considered difficult by some people, but learning it in an efficient way in a short period of time. And it has been taken up in lots of universities and companies, private companies. And there's kind of a dynamic battle, um, whether or not you're aware of it, that the government and the UK and, and in the States is is sort of uh, waging. That's another, it's another war metaphor that people won't like very much. Some people won't like. Um, they're talking about whether it's more efficient to spend a lot of money for a protracted degree and get a very wide, broad education. And then later you kind of figure out the nuts and bolts when you get into the workplace or become a scientist versus something like a boot camp, which just cuts through all the things that um, you might need and just give you the tools in your toolbox. And I'm not advocating either one, there are merits for both of those, but the boot camp is a format that um, also, some people argue, cut out all of the unnecessary details and just skill you up with the tools that you, that you want. Okay, anyway, I digress. Let's start talking about regression. Um, now, <clears throat> I think this picture is just birds on a line that I found somewhere like on Unsplash and, the the quote to set the tone here is you should be very suspicious if your data points sit all on on a straight line. But that's exactly what we're doing in regress in regression. We're making a, a prediction about where our data points will fall. 
and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about all the tools um, for that. This is a guy that I mentioned last week and uh, kind of son of a, a famous and infamous statistician, famous because of all the genius things he contributed to science and a bit infamous because he was not a very nice person in, in real life. But he had this um, famous data set. It was a it was a book he wrote that correlated the um, human height based on the the average height of your parents. And what he found in in this whole book, this is the whole book. And I'll just give you the whole book in like thirty seconds here. What he found and what this quote refers to is this phenomenon that um, people tend to be a little bit shorter than the average of their parents' height. And uh, we could talk a lot about it. Again, um, whole books have been written on this, but it's um, it's this, this phrase, regression to the mean, that uh, this phenomenon refers to. And, uh, and it has to do with the way that we we measure error in regressions and the way that the data points are scattered around that line that that causes this this phenomenon it's used incorrectly um this phrase these days regression to the mean it, it's usually used um in a non-statistical way these days but that's that's where it comes from and that's what it means now, um, here are what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what question we're asking with simple regression. This, I think applied scientists don't think about this very much. What is the statistical question we're um, thinking about? Another way of, of saying that in, in language that I prefer is uh, what is the evidence we're generating uh, when we perform a regression? what data we need, what assumptions we're making, what the typical graphs are, um, and some of the tests and alternatives uh, for for simple linear regression. OK, so um, well, you know, just like the graph I, I drew a moment ago, we've got some kind of numeric variable um, on the y axis and some kind of numeric predictor on the x-axis. The thing that I've, has begun to bug me, I don't have a good um, solution for this, is the way to refer to these kind of variables. The language is very variable. Um, there are a lot of different words that mean exactly the same thing. Like some people might just refer to the variable that traditionally would be depicted on the y-axis here as the y variable, or some people might call it the dependent variable. Um, because some people might call this the dependent variable, some people refer to the x variable as the independent variable or the predictor variable. But um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to predict values of y based on a measure uh, for some other predictor variable x. And our prediction for a regression is a straight line. So the, the idea here is that if we measure x here that we could go up to that value and make an inference about what the expected value of, of y is and that, that's what we're trying to do at least in part another thing that we can do with regression that is uh, something that gets me excited is we can quantify quantify variation so if you've got some kind of variable of interest over here um, I mean, it could be anything. It could be biodiversity. It could be the height of a person. It could be the weight of um, of a bull. It could be anything. <clears throat> the amount of yield per hectare, that sort of thing. Um, we we a lot of times focus on just the value that we measure in one field or in for one bull, but but actually um, one of the reasons that we use all statistics is that uh, we want to get a grip on where the variation in a measure comes from, how reliable that measure is. Um, another one is um, if, we're, if we're looking at something as a function of time or between individuals, maybe the degree of change, another way of saying the quantifying variation. And, 
And a lot of times we want to do null hypothesis significant testing. So um, this is one that I'll try to remember to say a few words about, because uh, as you'll see with regression, there are two parameters that we we estimate. One is um, where this line crosses the the y-axis, that's the intercept, and one is the uh, rise over the run, the so-called rise over the run ratio, <clears throat> which is the slope, and that's that's obviously the angle of this um, of this line relative to those two variables. Both of these parameters can be tested with null hypothesis testing, but we're usually interested only in the slope. That's what that's what regular old scientists test, and that's what we assign a p-value to and do null hypothesis testing for. Now, um, I really have to think hard about uh, these, uh, the way that this equation is written. I know a lot of people don't really like equations, but uh, this equation is one that will serve you well if you give it a little bit of time. It's, it's often written in different ways, in different fields. The exact same equation is usually um, it, in bachelor's programs for applied scientists, you might see something like y equals um, m plus uh, a, whoops, a x, you know, maybe something like that, where, um, or maybe it's uh, some other kind of letters might be used instead of m and a, but here, um, the one that I've chosen has got alpha for the intercept. And a, and a beta for the slope. Yet another way of doing it that you'll see quite a lot, which I'll, I'll take the trouble of writing just because it comes up and I want to make the point that it's exactly the same thing. It means exactly the same thing, but people use different symbology to relate it is, is yi equals beta zero <laughs> plus beta one xi plus the error. Now uh, here, the M, the alpha, and the beta zero all are an estimate of that intercept. And the A, the beta, and the beta one are all estimates of the single slope. If that's confusing and you don't like the looks of equations, just ignore them. It doesn't really matter. Um, I think that the reason that there are different variations here of this equation contributes to why people get angry and confused about seeing equations. I don't have a solution for that, unfortunately. But um, what I do want you to think about is that for simple linear regression, there are these two values, and it's mostly this one, the, uh, the slope one that we're doing hypothesis testing on. That's important to remember. <clears throat> make a few assumptions. Now, this is another one that it really helps if you think about these assumptions a long time and work with lots of data. Um, but one of the assumptions is that something called the residual error, error is, um, is Gaussian. It's got a normal distribution with a mean of zero and an estimated variance. That's sigma squared, a little Greek symbol sigma squared is this is the usually constant symbol for variance and sigma by itself is the um is the universal symbol for standard deviation um we we don't usually interpret or, or look at the sum of squares of the residuals but it's it's easy to calculate it's the foundation of regression and it's it's one of the ways that we um, estimate the error that I was talking about in our model. And uh, for these equations, um, we think about the mean of X and the mean of Y as the, the mean of our variables, the mean of the predictor variable X and the mean of the dependent variable Y. Um, and uh, a further complication, and a, there won't be many more equations after this one, uh, I sort of promise, but there still might be one or two, is that um, <clears throat> when I wrote those equations, uh, when we see them um, in, in that form with 
alpha plus beta um, plus the error. Notice there's um, there's just an alpha and there's just a beta, but these have a little um, little caret symbol or the hat symbol on them. And that's sort of the statistical or mathematical shorthand for an estimate. So whereas um, this equation might uh, very, very formally, it's a very formal way of thinking about things, but it might refer in theory to um, if we could add, if we could measure somehow the universal population that contained all of those measures we might ever want to be interested in. Of course, we can never measure that, that ultimate population. Um, then we would represent those numbers that we directly measured with all the individuals we're interested in in a population with, uh, with alpha and beta. But when we take a sample of the population, we, um, we can only estimate those parameters and there is error associated with our estimation of the parameters. And this is a formal, um, a formal way to think about uh, how we estimate them. I'm not going to get into the nuts and bolts of that. Again, that's beyond what we're doing here. But um, I do want to talk about some of the assumptions. These are ones that are important. We can't gloss over on these. They are often lost even on simple analyses though. So um, if you have a regression and you have some data that looks like that, uh, data that looks like those dots for some variable X and some variable um, Y will uh, definitely be, it will definitely be possible to calculate a regression uh, for those, but it violates, um, well, at least one of the assumptions of a linear relationship. Uh, another assumption here is that um, for our Y variable, uh, it's it's numeric um, and it's continuous. And our X variable can be uh, an ordinal categorical variable, though. So X um, down here can either be um, numeric or it could be a, an ordinal variable that has, has order but is um, categorical. Uh, we also assume, assume that the, um, the observations, each of these little dots, is independent of all the others. This one's a subtle one, and it's one that's violated quite a lot um, by applied biologists. When we violate um, this assumption, and we do a simple linear regression anyway, we commit this um, this crime called pseudo replication. Why is it a crime? Well, it's a crime because it it when you're performing a statistical test, it uh, it performs the test. Um, setting an assumption that you have a much larger independent sample size than you do. And um, you, you're much more likely to make an error, create a, a false positive usually. Uh, we have this assumption of Gaussian residuals. Now, um, this is a funny one on the residual one, and we're going to talk about that. When we have a, a linear regression, I think we'll have a picture of this in a second. We have a dot here. We have a dot here. We have a dot here. And there's little lines between our line of prediction and our actual observations are called residuals. They're the difference between our actual observations and that line of prediction. And when we, one of the things that I see happening a lot is that people are used to this assumption of um, the normal distribution, the Gaussian distribution, and they they assume that that means that uh, their their y variable is Gaussian, and that their x variable is Gaussian. They they assume that this Gaussian assumption means that each of these 
are themselves normal. That's actually not what this assumption means. This assumption means that if we took these values here for every data point, some will be positive and some will be negative, and we were to graph them, the residual starting at, at the mean of zero, that the residuals themselves would be Gaussian distributed so that most of the observations would be close to zero. They'd be, that just means that they, they're close to the line and that a few observations would be further away. And furthermore, that there's, there's no skew, um, that there's an even balance of ones that are far away uh, from, the, from the line. And that, that even balance has got a special name. Uh, if we had enough time, I'd take a little survey and ask for some brave volunteers to pronounce that word. There's actually an academic paper on how to pronounce that word that, uh, that teaches us in modern language how it's properly pronounced. A Greek guy wrote it, so I presume this uh, stems from the Greek language that it's based on, but it's, it's a hard C, almost scedasticity, and that refers to an uh, evenness of variance. So the, this distribution, this balanced distribution of the residuals is evenly distributed along the whole range of this X variable. Okay, and that's the totality of the assumptions. In reality, the assumptions that people, the most important two, if you can only remember two, are these two here. The uh, independence of observations and, and the Gaussian distribution. Homoscedasticity is related to the, the Gaussian distribution of residuals, so it would be unusual to have a very um, a data set that is um, violates homoscedasticity greatly if it had perfectly Gaussian residuals. It's possible, but it would be unusual. So these are the two most important assumptions. Okay, it says off to R. We're going to use a um, fish market data set. <clears throat> so you um, can go to the boot camp page. Again, I'll just drop it in the chat if people like to follow along with that. <clears throat> We'll go down now. Um, I think I'm going to need to download this. I'm going to save this as. I'm going to um, navigate to <clears throat> pages. Let me see here. Yeah, Tim. I think I'm going to go to another place on my computer that's more convenient for me. There we go. See what I already have in here. Don't already have the fish data set in there. And I'm just going to copy that. I'm going to save the data set. And um, I'm going to go to R. I've already got this set up. I'm going to close this project. And I'm going to open a file. So I've already prepared file. There we go. Prepare to file with nothing in it. OK. So um, we're just going to do our normal thing. <clears throat> where I'm going to set up a header. And see that I have my um, you see that little grayed out bit? It was trying to guess my name. I have my um, Google Copilot turned on, which I'm just going to turn off because it, it just irritates me sometimes. And I don't want it to guess. As I usually don't need it unless I'm doing something ambitious. So I'm going to undo that, apply that. OK, now it won't bother us. What? And when? Maybe we'll have a um, 
if we do a session on Google, I mean on GitHub and Git, we can do a session on Copilot. If people are interested in using that as an automated tool to help with our code, you can only really use it effectively if you have the basics, so it's appropriate to use it after you go through the boot camp. But anyway, so we're going to um, copy this code. Now I need to set my um, working directory. I'm just going to set this to um, <clears throat> see. It's going to be in my session. Set it to the source file location. Load up the library OpenXLSX. And uh, let's load up the data. Now I didn't put this in the data folder. Let's put it in my root folder. So three, two, one, it's be up in the global environment. I'm just going to make this a bit bigger for people to see. There it is. We just have a, pe a peek at this. You can read on the the uh, Kaggle page. I may have linked to it or may have given some information on the bootcamp, but this is basically um, um, some measurements of 159 fish, individual fish taken from um, from a fish market. <clears throat> The, um, the species name, the common name, is uh, a variable. The weight uh, in grams, I believe. There are three different links that refer to different um, parts of the fish body. And then there's a height and a width that are also different parts of the, the fish body. Now, I don't remember the units. Let's see how... Um, how nice I was on the web page and whether I've, I've given some information about that. I think I talked through um, what it is. It's been a while since I worked with this. Um, you can just open up the Kaggle fish market page. Oops, that's just downloading the um, the data object. So we would have to go to Kaggle really to uh, to explore this with the uh, full data. So instead, let's just let's just explore the uh, data set organically as I've laid out on the page. So one of the first things we're going to do is just look at the um, the names of the variables in the data object that we've just made named fish. Now we can look at that up in the environment, but uh, what I want you to get used to is using these these script tools. You can never go wrong, and it's often much faster to use the script tools. And if you have a um, small data set like this, there are only just the seven variables. It's very easy to use the global environment, and you're probably thinking, in fact, I hope you're thinking, Ed, why are you trying to be so hardcore when we can just look up here and see the picture of the variables? But there's a good reason for this. It's not just that it's good for you and you should eat your vegetables. It's also that if you have a very a data set that's got uh, only seven variables in it, this is no help. But what if you have 25 variables or 70 variables or 200 variables? Now, um, a lot of you may or may not have variable um, counts that big. Some of you will. And uh, this kind of tool becomes essential when you have more than just a few and it becomes a burden to scroll in the graphical uh, user interface. So that's that's really the reason. So um, we're going to use the table function to um, reach inside the data object fish and look at the um, species. Now I've chosen the table. If you have a categorical variable, I use this a lot just to explore the data set. And this just gives us the count of each common name that comes up in the vector fish cache species. Okay, so some of hopefully you recognize most of these. I recognize all of them except this one. Does anyone recognize what the parky fish is? I don't know what that one is. Um, we're going to slice out some rows for perch, and uh, we've done this before when we few weeks ago now where we um, where we <clears throat> could generate a vector, a Boolean vector 
that asks for every, if we just print out all of the fish species, we'll see that they come in all varieties. What this is asking in Boolean languages, um, which of the fish species uh, values is equivalent to the equal equal sign uh, perch. And we see that we should see a bunch of um, a bunch of falses and then some trues here. Trues roughly between 91 and 129 or something like that. So three, two, one. And that's what we see, a bunch of falses. And um, you know, if we wanted to, we could wrap that in a table and uh, get the counts or uh, what those are like. Let's just do that real quick. This this is the kind of exploratory data analysis that, you know, you just do it without thinking about it because you need an answer to to think about how to analyze your data. So we do this kind of thing quite a lot. So it turns out we have 56 um, instances of uh, perch in there. OK. So um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to slice out the um, the. Um, these rows. So this will create that vector of trues and falses. And I'm going to use the fish data object, wrapping it in the square brackets. And uh, have that comma. So whenever we have a uh, data object like this, I'm just going to copy it, move to R. Whenever I, we have a data object like this, um, remember that the, the first space before the comma is the rows and the last space is the columns. So what we're specifying here is uh, for the fish data set, we want to grab all of the 56 rows that are equal to perch, the trues and this vector, and all of the columns. So what should pop up up here in the environment is uh, we should have 59 observations for seven variables for a perch data object. Let's just make that real quick, three, two, one. It's 56. Yes, of course it is, not 59. And then uh, we could print the head. If you'll remember, that just prints the um, the um, first uh, few lines of the perch data set, three, two, one. We can see we've got values for each of those um, variables, all perch. So we've just sliced out. There's a little note that I would say here. Note that the um, the row numbers here in our data object start at 73. Um, it's not indicated up in the global environment, but that's because we sliced it from a bigger data object, and that is that is to prevent us from making mistakes. If you if you index those addresses for one data object and you slice out something from that data object, the, you don't want the indices to change if you've used the in the explicit addresses. So that's just a little peculiarity of R to remember. Usually we can just ignore it. OK, what else are we going to do? Um, let's, let's go back to the slides and see if if um, <clears throat> we've got some assumptions. Oh, I'm going to keep going on the web page for now and then come back when we go to graphing. So I think I've gone through slides that talked about the assumptions and then OK, we're at graphing. All right, so um, the traditional way to graph a simple linear regression would be to uh, graph the the dependent variable on the y-axis of a scatter plot, and the x um, or predictor variable or independent variable on the x-axis. So here <coughs> we're going to graph that um, height variable as a function of the width variable. It's also traditional for simple, simple linear regression to put the regression line on our on our scatter plot. And then finally, um, it's traditional in some disciplines, but not all of them, to uh, to actually print out the parameters for the equation for that line. So um, if you remember from math in school, this equation for a linear regression is the equation of a line. Um, and that's the regression line. So printing out the equation does a couple of things. One, it 
formally symbolizes what we're doing and it's it's just a bit of a tradition in some disciplines these days a little old-fashioned to print it out but it's not incorrect and a lot of people really appreciate it uh, i certainly do and i know a lot of other reviewers that i've worked with also do um, but it also gives explicit values for that intercept and for that uh, that slope and uh, that that's a little bit of extra information that some people will find very useful. A few people might even find it essential. OK. Let's see what the next slide is. So um, we're going to uh, make a plot and add a regression line to it. Now, the way we do simple linear regression in R is with the LM function that just stands for linear model. So I'm um, just going to grab this code and take it over there and see what it what it looks like in R. <clears throat> so um, the first thing we're going to do here is to uh, make a plot. Now my way of um, doing statistics, I've, I've sort of imposed this on these bootcamp pages. Is uh, I I would tend to to draw a picture with a plot, with a graph of some form that represents and is appropriate for the statistic that I'm about to calculate. I'll, I'll graph it because uh, graphing it um, creates an expectation in my mind that I can instantly compare to the results of the, um, of the, the statistical analysis. Now this takes practice to do. One, you have to know what statistic you want to do. And and by the way, we haven't covered this yet, but you you should endeavor to pick out your entire statistical analysis before you collect your data. Uh, we often wait until later to think about the analysis after the data are collected, but it really shouldn't be that way. Two, you have to know what um, the appropriate kind of graph and standard is for the statistical test. And, and this is much more efficient than just um, doodling around and making loads and loads of graphs. So uh, for <clears throat> linear regression, we're just going to make a scatter plot. For that in base R, we just use the plot function. I'm going to set the, um, now these days, I like to organize my, my code to look like this in R, where I have one argument per line. I'm going to set the Y variable equal to height x variable equal to width. I'm going to go ahead and put in my own um, labels for those axes. I'm going to go ahead and put a main title on the top of that plot. I've done a few other things here. Um, by default, <coughs> the PCH is a um, parameter that tells you the shape of your of your um, dot symbol on a scatter plot. So shape 20, um, I think my favorite shape is shape 16, which is just a small circle that's solid. And the color is blue. And uh, the CEX is a, um, is a uh, parameter that um, creates, it scales the size of objects on plots relative to, um, <clears throat> relative to the uh, the area of the plot. So uh, CEX equal to one is the default. Let's go ahead and make it. It'll pop up up here in the plots, three, two, one. You can play around with all of these. Let's see what 20 would have done. I think that might be squares or something, three, two, one. Oh, it's smaller dots. Okay, so I was picking the larger dots. And you can change the color. We could make it goldenrod. We could make them, uh, you know, a little bit bigger. 1.5, 3, 2, 1. Makes them big. No, I don't like the 3, 2, the 1.5 because they start to overlap one another. Uh, you could make them quite small. We could just make them 0. 0.5, 3, 2, 1. They're a bit easier to see individual dots that way. Um, but we'll leave them at 1 for this. Now, um, the things we're looking at here, the things that I like about this analysis is that there seems to be a very strong linear relationship. There seems to be um, a very tight relationship. 
So that means our, our regression is likely to be highly significant. They're, um, they're, I don't see anything that bothers me about the spread of residuals. Uh, so I don't see any, any reason to believe that there's going to be non-Gaussian distribution of residuals here. And uh, again, this takes practice to view this. And, you know, we might, we might, um, some people might uh, say, well, well, is my, is my dependent variable Gaussian? <clears throat> we could use a histogram to just uh, look at that real quick. Whoops. And, um, you know, if we superimpose a Gaussian shape over that, it, it's rough. You know, it doesn't look extremely Gaussian, but it's it's only 159 variables. This gap, does that bother you? So I noticed that gap myself, and it bothers me a little bit. But for now, we're going to ignore that gap. Um, I would be worried if we had multiple fish species in here, uh, which we do, <laughs> because they may come from different distributions. And uh, it does appear that it's likely that we have some. Um, oh, this is just perch. OK, so this is just perch. So um, we, it looks like we have some big perch and we have some much smaller perch, two different groups of perch. OK. So um, now uh, we want to draw on our line of best fit. Now to do that in R, we, we have to go ahead and actually calculate our statistical test. And uh, the way we do that is with the, um, as I said on the web page, the LM function, the linear model function. Now um, we specified the formula. We haven't really talked a lot about our formulas, but with this little symbol, the tilde, the little squiggle, we read this as um, height as a function of width. Notice here for the formula, I don't specify the data object. Instead, we specify the data object. This is just the traditional norm in R uh, in the data argument. So we're talking about the perch data. And uh, this is nice because we can change this to a slice like we've got, or we can change it to some other slice if we wanted to. It's also nice because it makes the um, the formula itself easier to read, it makes it very clear to read. Let's just go ahead and calculate that. And then I'm going to print out, I'm putting it into an object called myLM, and then we'll just print that out into the uh, console down here. So let's just run that now, three, two, one, and let's print it out, three, two, one. So all we get when we print this out um, like this, is we get our intercept, which rounds up to about 0.30, and our slope, which is 1.59. A thing about the slope, I mentioned it very briefly. I'll go back to the, the um, slides for just a second. Well, here's a new slide. Is um, if you've got your your line here that we've calculated. <clears throat> I mentioned that the slope is a ratio, and it's the rise over the run. That's the way that I was taught to memorize this. The slope is the rise over the run. And uh, if you've got your y and your x, um, the slope is a ratio of the, the rise over the run in actual units for for any for any interval of uh, of x so for you know between 5 and 6 whatever the value of of y would be um, this is a run of 1 okay and uh, we know that our slope is equal to 1.59. So this rise we kind of go for these points where x is um, between 5 and 6. We know that this will be 1.59. <laughs> That's how that works. 
I've drawn that five really terribly. Sorry about that. That's so embarrassing. I'm going to draw it again. There we go. OK, so that's how you interpret the uh, the slope. Why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because it is related to making predictions. We know that now we have a quantitative estimate of um, when our predictor variable changes, we have a quantitative estimate of exactly how that's going to affect our uh, expectation of values in our dependent variable. All right, so as I was saying, we we need to calculate the regression, which we just did, in order to um, to draw that line on there. Let's see what the web page has to say about that. We we'll use the AB line function to do that. <clears throat> there we go. Copy that. Come back. Now we've already used the AB line function, and we've talked about the fact that we would not use the AB line function to draw a line on a correlation scatter plot. Just by convention, we don't do it. That line means something, and it means something different. A regression line means something different <laughs> to a correlation statistic. So th there are two reasons there why we don't do it. It's it's wrong to do it, and it's also tradition not to do it. What we do here is we um, use the AB line function to draw that regression. We're setting the re the reg argument to the value of our regression object that we saved. So let's just go ahead and, and draw that line. That's a really tight line. We can also um, draw that text on our axis here with the text function. We're going to set it at y equal to or x equals to three. This will put whatever text we write, it'll center it on whatever value of the um, x-axis we want. And y we'll put at 11, which will be roughly up here somewhere. And then our label is um, just taking a rounded amount of variables. And I've just made a little text string, 3, 2, 1. The text function is really easy to use. We could, we could put anything we want. And it's, again, this concept of layering um, graphs. <clears throat> we could put another message in here at, you know, x equals seven, y equals, um, you know, four. And sometimes it's appropriate to um, to do that. This idea of layering graphs is probably the most powerful one. So we've layered it with the scatter plot, we've layered it with lines, and we've layered it with some text. Magda? Ed, um, uh, may yeah. I very gently critique this plot? <laughs> Please do. <laughs> when we say that uh, the intercept is 0.3, shouldn't we adjust the axis so indeed the intercept of the line which we plotted um, crosses the y-axis below number two because otherwise it doesn't seem to be true it looks funny that way you're right you're right yeah it's funny um you're totally correct um by convention we usually don't do that but we could do that let's do it real quick uh, what you're saying is that, well, let's first talk about the meaning of the intercept. <clears throat> mm -hmm. The meaning of the intercept is that's where it touches the y-axis when x is equal to exactly zero. Mm -hmm. And uh, by convention, we we usually set our, for a regression scatter plot, we would usually set the boundaries of our axes, especially for our predictor variable, to approximately the same range as our observations. The reason for that is to um, is to prevent people from extrapolating, which we you know should try to avoid doing. It's very unsafe behavior <laughs> sure. with regression. but but you're quite right. It's a little bit confusing to do it that way. and we could just do that really easily by setting our x limb equal to zero um, and let's say nine. 
-hmm. And let's draw it again. Three, two, one. There we go. Okay. And there, there we go. And oh, let me see. Where's my AB line? There we go. Oops. Now I made that histogram since <laughs> I made that line. Let me just comment that out and make that again. <clears throat> there we go. We'd, we'd need in this case to set the Y limit as well if we really, really want to see that. So let's just do that and see what it looks like. Y lamb to zero and we'll take it up to, it looks like it's going to go up to about 13 or something. Boom. There we go. We'll make our AB line. Yeah, I mean, yep. um, I mean that, uh, that uh, it's actually hard to see that. It should be at point three, but the, the axis tick is, this is even worse because it looks wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yes. It is just a, all about just playing with the axis, yeah. It's all about just playing. If you really wanted to do that, but by convention, we wouldn't we wouldn't do that with the regression just to prevent that extrapolation. Like here, it doesn't this is like another thing with continuous variables. Um often the intercept is uh, something that if you're if you're um if your regression, remember your, your regression has error both in where it intercepts on the y axis, but also in that slope. And in, in this case, what if we had a, we have a very slightly positive, um, positive intercept when width equals zero, but when would when width equal zero? It never would equal zero. It could be very small for a very small fish. But it actually is nonsensical to to even ask that. <laughs> it's only used. That's it's one of the reasons that we're always focused on the slope for making predictions for any value of x rather than focusing on the intercept. Anyway, I'm digressing and we're yeah, running yeah. out of time. <laughs> Thank that you. Is a, that's Thanks. a good question. Yeah, no problem. Let's see where we are in the slides so we can get. Now, uh, <clears throat> we talk about visualizing the residuals and testing those assumptions. Now, um, what this plot does, I think, is it is a representation of the residuals for our plot here. So uh, if we make our plot and we make our, our line again, this arrows function draws little lines on the function. And if you if you look, if I just zoom in a little bit, so that we can see those lines are the residuals. They're the values of the residuals on that. And it's, remember, the Gaussian assumption is the um, distribution of the residuals themselves. <clears throat> so what we can do is we can um, do that QQ plot like we did before. Remember, that's in the, um, the car package. I mentioned that... Um, I think that's Andrew Gelman's package, but it's classification and regression, a popular kind of hardcore regression book. It would be like for a whole class on regression. Um, so if I make, um, I load the car package and then make two plots together, this is kind of like what we did last time. What we can see is that for our residuals, um, now they're not perfectly Gaussian. We have we have quite a lot of them that are really close and and very few that are far away. See that the range is more or less um, balanced, minus 1.5 and po positive 1.5. If I had to criticize this histogram for something suspicious, these shoulders are very um, low. And uh, if we look at our line, almost everything falls on the line, and um, we have a few for our theoretical prediction that are that are a little bit um, a little bit fewer on one end and a little bit more on the other ends and that's referring to these these uh, little tails over here I mean um, <clears throat> what we're doing here notice is that uh, I've made a histogram 
and I've used the residuals function to grab the actual values of the residual off of that linear model object. So when we print out that linear model object, there's not much to it. But if we use the residuals function, it will pull out all of the actual values. They're all very small. And then we can wrap that in the histogram to uh, to make it. I'm going to set my par back to to one. There we go. Let's get through the rest of this code so that we can um, finish. So it looks like I'm going to do some other stuff here with the histogram. So we're making a histogram. This is just the same old histogram. We're going to add the density lines. Now we've already done this once before. We're going to add a density line for our residuals using the density function. Three, two, one. Really, it's just vanity to do this. We don't have to do this. And um, we could make a theoretical line for the Gaussian and draw a curve using the curve function to compare the density, the green line of our residuals to the theoretical Gaussian perfect blue line. And they fit pretty closely because remember they're sampling error. We don't we don't expect this. And let's also uh, do the expected mean for both of those. So the red line we know will be exactly perfect on the theoretical Gaussian, and it should be really close to our green density line of our actual observations, and, and sure enough, it is. We could add a legend to that, layering um, onto this. We have done the legend function before. Now, my uh, it looks funny because I've made my text big so that you guys can read it. But just so that you can see, I've just changed my text to be a bit smaller and I'll redraw the graph. Three, two, one, to redraw everything, all the layers. See how it readjusted the box size when I did that? It's a, it's a, one of the behaviors of R is that the magnification of your local window in R Studio dictates the behavior of some of the layers. So it's a little thing to be beware of. It also affects the CEX default values for the um, axis labels. OK, what else have we got here? <clears throat> now, the thing that we haven't done, the thing that I want to end up for is. Um, uh, I think there'll be a demonstration of how to do a statistical test an objective test for how to test your whether your residuals are Gaussian. I may skip that. Uh, oh, we might as well because it's just short. So one that you can use, and there are loads of them. Um, if you have a good reason to use one or another, use it. But if you don't have a good reason, you could use the Shapiro test. It's perfectly good for a simple linear regression. Here, what I've done is I've just plucked out the residuals from our linear model object. Let's make this a little bit bigger for everybody. And I've just done Shapiro.test. This is a statistical test that asks the question, are these distributed Gaussian? Three, two, one. <clears throat> we can ignore the warning here, but we get um, a test statistic. Here it's the Shapiro, the Wilkes W. Um, now this, the bigger this is, um, the the more different you will be from the Gaussian. We usually wouldn't look at that very closely or even report it for this kind of data. What we're interested in is this p-value. And uh, we compare p-value. Here we're testing the hypothesis. We're using the null hypothesis testing framework here in a kind of a weird way. because. We don't really think there is a difference here, yet we're testing whether there is a difference. And if the p-value is less than 0.05, it would be evidence that our residuals are different to Gaussian. Because the p-value is not smaller than 0.05, we can conclude that there is no evidence that our residuals are different to Gaussian. So we, we accept the null. 
this is not quite the same. It's not precisely the same as being able to say our residuals um, are Gaussian. We don't have evidence of that. We have we have evidence that um, that um, if they are different to Gaussian, we fail to find it. <laughs> That's a subtle distinction. But in, in any case, what the way you use this practically is you look at that and if it's bigger than 0.05, you don't have to worry about your assumption of Gaussian anymore. Now, the last thing that we um, have not done is um, we haven't looked at our summary. I'm going to just quickly look at the summary of our linear model. And I'll let you go through the rest of the um, the um, <clears throat> the boot camp page for the rest of the detail on there. But this is an important one because it's the uh, table that has our statistical test for our regression. Now, this is arranged in what some people would call an ANOVA table. And notice that it's got our estimates. It's got our intercept. Now, remember, we're not usually interested in the intercept. The statistical test that this line is testing is whether or not our intercept is different to zero. We're not interested in that in this case. We're interested in whether our slope is uh, different to zero, because if the um, if the slope is flat, if it's not different to zero, that means there's no relationship between our variables. But if it's different to zero, that means there is a relationship. That's what we're testing here. This is an important thing, maybe the most important thing for this whole boot camp, that what you're statistically testing when you perform simple linear regression is whether or not that slope is different to zero. So this is the line that we're um, we're interested in. Our p-value is very small, scientific notation, so it's less than 0 0.0001. We've got our estimate of our slope, and we've got a standard error for a slope. So uh, another way of thinking about this p-value is that 95% um, confidence interval is, is uh, 1.96 times or let's just say two times the standard error. So uh, we estimate with pretty good certainty that our slope is 1.59 plus or minus 0.08. So it's between roughly 1.51 and uh, you know 1.67. Oh, thank you. A instead of E. <laughs> is that somewhere on the boot camp? <laughs> I'll have to find that. OK, and I think that that's all we have time for. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to do this because we are out of time. We're quite a bit over. I'm going to go ahead and stop the um, recording. Any comments or, um, or questions? Now, if you would like to stay on and watch me fix that that typo, <laughs> I will. But other than that, we're finished. Happy Easter, everybody! Thanks for coming, and I will. Uh, I'll see you next week. Megan, if you're in tomorrow, I'll be in. Maybe we could sit down and and just touch bases after the holiday at some point. Yep, yeah, sounds good. Okay, I'll, maybe I'll send an email for some good time. I, I got to awesome. look at my calendar. <laughs> cool. And I'll see everyone later. I am going to fix this before I log off. So if you want to sit around and chat or just watch me do it, that's fine. I'm going to open up the regression page. <clears throat> I'm going to search for heteroscedasticity. Oops. It's a very mean catch. Is that the only one? I think so.
All right, yeah, thanks for catching that. Thanks everyone for coming. There we go, it's fixed for next time. I'm just gonna go ahead and push that on GitHub while we're here. There we go. Gonna have to stop my Dropbox to do this. There we go, committing to main. And pushing, William, are you there? Guess not, see you later.